All right, so I am Chris, and this is going to be React on Rails 6. We're going to talk more about more than just uh, React. I got iTunes jumping here. Shut up, iTunes. Um, so we're going to talk about Rails 6 and some of the features I think are pretty neat. Uh, and then we're going to live code React on Rails 6. It is like super easy now, so that is going to be exciting. Um, there's not that many people here, so it's pretty informal. If you have questions, whatever, then jump in. Um, yeah, you can find me at myname.com or at my name uh, on Twitter. All right, so quickly, who, uh, let's survey for Rails experience. Who is like beginner, we'll say? All right, a couple beginners in advanced. We'll jump right to advanced. All right, cool. How about React? Beginners for React and advanced for React. One, sweet. All right, then we will, I'll do a little bit of a Rails intro as we get into it and a little bit more of a React intro um, so that you know what's going on. I have notes on my phone, so if I look at my phone, that's what's going on. All right, so Rails 6 came out, it was last month. Uh, like Dave said, if you are on 5.1 or less, then you now only have, um, if you're on 5.1 or, sorry, higher, then you have security updates less and you should probably migrate because you get severe updates and nothing else. So, um, yes? Uh, is it true that Rails 6 drops RSpec, or does it just change the testing? It, 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 does it drop it by default? It, it never can RSpec. Yeah. Um, it, so there's two testing uh, options now. Um, RSpec is still one of them. Yeah. I mean, there's many testing options, but there are two kind of built-in ones. Okay, here are some of the features. One, which I think is pretty cool, is multiple databases. Now, this is built in. Previously, you had to like really mess around if you wanted to read from more than one database. Um, this is from TopTal. This is a diagram that they show. And I actually think this may not be how most people use it, but they say requests come in, it hits different apps, so these are your servers, right? And then it goes to a master DB to write, or read replicas to read, and maybe an analytics read, they say. All right. Um, the reason I think most people might not use it this way, or it's kind of dangerous to think about it this way, is this feels like premature optimization. Like, I think people will see this and think, oh, I need to replicate my database and read from that, when really, probably most people don't need to do that. And so what I think is more common is, like, uh, companies will have, like, several different databases, like a data team will have a database, or some, you know, something else will have, they'll store data somewhere, and then you'll have your master Rails database, and I don't necessarily think most people will replicate data and read from that. I think instead it's more likely that you'll read from a master Rails data, or read and write to a master Rails database, and then you will, say, read from an analytics database or a data team database or whatever. Um, but you can do it native, natively now, which is neat. So uh, this is how you do it. So now we have a primary. I think you can name these whatever you want. But And then their example is animals and animals replica, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and to connect to it, you can connect to a database and tell it whether you're writing or reading and what you're writing or reading to. So this is by a uh, model. So that's kind of neat. And then your model reads or writes to different databases. Okay, next is bulk database updates. Previously, you either had to write your SQL by hand or do it in a big loop, uh, which is not uh, great. These do uh, a single SQL uh, query for insert a whole bunch of stuff, update a whole bunch of stuff, upsert a whole bunch of stuff. So you give it an array, does it one big SQL query so that you don't have to write it yourself. That's pretty cool. All right, parallel testing. This is a little bit towards the testing thing. Um, you can now parallel, parallelize your testing locally if you've done this, or natively. If you've done this before, um, there have been lots of hacks to get around it to use multiple cores and whatever. Um, but now you can either set parallelize with the number of workers, or you can run um, like parallel workers equals four as an environment variable and run your tests and it just kind of works, which is cool. I have not tested this. I have not tested the, the parallelized testing, um, but supposedly it works and runs on multiple cores and everything. All right, this one I think is pretty cool and we'll see it tonight. Uh, the tricks editor, which was made by Basecamp, is a rich text editor um, and it's now, you, it's not built in, but you can install it with one command, uh, which I think is pretty cool because I've done rich text before and it's been a big pain in the butt. Um, but it is, it kind of all just works, which is really neat. So we'll see how that works. 
Although, <laughs> spoiler alert, uh, images don't work right now, and I don't know if it's me or Rails. So <laughs> I found someone else with the same problem online and zero answers on Stack Overflow, so it's probably, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see, I'll show you. Um, okay, uh, this is how you do it. We'll see this, basically. Uh, it, it sort of threw me for a loop. Uh, you don't put columns on your model. Instead, you have a different migration, and then it's a uh, single table inheritance to your model. And so, and then you just say, has rich text, and then the name of your rich text field. Um, and it does it all kind of by magic, it stores it all in one big table. And uh, so we'll see that. All right, Webpack. This, is, this was exciting to me, because I'm a JavaScript person, as well as a Rails person. Uh, I'll explain before how you had to do it, and then also how you do it now. So Webpack is now the default JS bundler. If you've ever, uh, Webpacker, sorry. If you've ever dealt with Webpack before, like Webpack config, it is a pain. And so the fact that they were able to do it uh, seamlessly is super exciting. Um, there are a bunch of rate tasks. We'll see the React one tonight, but I'll also list them all. Uh, so Webpacker install React, and that sets everything up for you, which is awesome. And then Webpack dev server is the command, and it just works. So we'll see that all. All right, let's get to Rails. And anybody have any questions about those? Those are all the features I'm going to go over. There's a few other ones. Um, they're mostly minor. Rails 6 has been sort of deemed kind of a, a minor major update. Like, there's lots of neat things in it, but there's nothing like crazy breaking. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, okay, so there's Webpack and then Webpacker. Uh, Webpack is a JavaScript um, library, I guess you call it. And it, what it does is it allows you to um, make a build pipeline for JavaScript. So JavaScript, the way most people write it today, has to be transpiled before, um, so not really compiled, but transpiled before it runs on different browsers. And Webpack will do that for you. Um, the problem is Webpack is really confusing, mostly because build pipelines are really confusing. <laughs> there are a million ways you can add dependencies. There are lots of different versions of things. There are lots of, um, you have to avoid circular loops and all this stuff. So um, Webpack is just really confused. Plus, like, I think it was originally written in German or Polish or something, and so the documentation like, wasn't great, and so people had to like, uh, change the documentation into English. And anyway, Webpacker is a Rails gem, a Ruby gem, that came along and made it super easy to configure with Ruby. So if you have a Rails 5 app, you can update to Webpacker. Um, it's just a few commands, and then you get all the goodness that you're going to see uh, here. So Rails 5 also gets this uh, with just a quick upgrade, which is nice. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to um, build all of your JavaScript nicely into a production-ready JavaScript uh, to run on the browser. Okay. Uh, before Webpack, or before Webpacker, really, and before this update, mostly people ran React like this. Um, you have your Rails app, and it is your backend. It's your API, and you have React, which mostly was meant single page app. Um, a lot of people still do it this way. This is super common. The single page app is usually created with create React app. There are a handful of other ways to do it as well. Um, but what the move to Webpacker allows you to do is something more like this. Um, you could also do this before, it was just a little harder. But now you have Rails, which kind of serves all your stuff. And you can put React sort of wherever you want it. Um, it can be one big single page app if you want. But now it's much, much easier to just drop it in wherever you want. And so you can have pages with some ERB, some React, and uh, so it's, it's super neat. Um, we will see an example of that in a bit. Okay, now I want to switch to a demo. Anyone have any questions before we go to a demo? Yep. I know you're talking about React, but would this, would this also apply to like Yes, so when we uh, see the rate commands, you'll see it has view, uh, Angular, I don't remember, there's a few, yes. And so yeah, it um, comes built in with uh, some of those pipelines. It, it also, it comes with those, but since Webpacker is in there, it, it will build anything that Webpacker can build, which is really any JavaScript front end. So once you use Webpacker, you can yarn install anything you want, and you can compile it. So there are some built-in templates for like React and other things, but it really just simplifies the JavaScript pipeline for whatever you want to use. Yep. So how Uh, so you don't have to. There's other ways to do it. Um, you can use Webpack, like raw Webpack, if you want. Um, you can use, like I said, so I still like this a lot, actually, which is use create React app as a main single page front end, 
and then use Rails as kind of the API. I still like doing that, and that doesn't use Webpack or Create React app, actually uses Webpack in the background. It's just all JavaScript instead of using the Webpacker um, gem. And so, and then there's another way that you can get, that you can accomplish this, which is to, you can just um, use the CDN to use uh, React and React DOM, and then you can still do this without any build steps. Um, that's mostly for like if you have just a little bit of React, <laughs> as soon as you try to get advanced at all, then you want some kind of build pipeline. Um, and then Webpacker, I think, is the best one, but there are a couple others. Can, but I don't know if it does by default. It, it, so the old asset pipeline is still there. Um, JavaScript is off by default now for all new apps, but you can re-include JavaScript in asset pipeline if you want to. Um, and they can both run side by side. The recommendation is still to use asset pipeline for CSS because while Webpacker can do Webpack can do CSS, it can also do a metric craft ton of other things not well, um, so while it's possible to do pipe all your CSS through Webpacker, at least Rails 14 deems it not good enough for ease of use, so they left asset pipeline, pipeline still there with SCSS gym now the default for um, SAS compilation, um, and so unless you're doing like something fancy with React like style components, which does styling for you baked into React, you pretty much still just want to have old-fashioned style sheets through Asset Pipeline. Um, Asset Pipeline, since Rails 5, was able to um, access node modules if it's in the same directory as the root of your Rails app. So if you're, so like Bootstrap, for example, installed from Yarn or from NPM, Asset Pipeline can access the style sheets part of it, while Repacker can access the Bootstrap JavaScript part of it to Bootstrap that. Um, if you want. I agree. That's, that's good. I just want to say though, too, um, so if you are using style components or CSS and JS, it supports that pretty well. It can compile on the fly, but there's an option to say um, basically extract CSS and it puts out a separate CSS file. It's the same name as your pack that yeah. we haven't really talked about yet. Um, but it'll basically pull all the CSS and put it into a special pack file, so it's, uh, it's pre-compiled and faster to paint on your page load. But that works well as well. Yeah. All right, anything else? Cool, all right. It'll take me a second to get set up here. So if your JavaScript is all the asset pipeline copy script stuff, mm -hmm. are you kind of stuck doing that? Or is there any benefit to bringing it into the um, if it's if it was if it's just plain JavaScript, you could almost copy paste into the app uh, webpack side of it. If it's copy script, I believe web I believe there's a pat a JavaScript npm package for transpiling copy script into probably ES6, which then transpiles back down to ES5, that you could run through Webpacker, um, or just Webpack. The problem is always the configuration of Webpack to include a new uh, filter. They call them filter plugins or some, something similar to that. Um, the benefit of Webpacker, just doing JavaScript is, that is all set up for you through the Webpacker gym as far as the configuration goes. So if you need something out of the ordinary, you are free to edit the either the Babel config file or the Webpacker config file or the uh, node module, not not uh, package JSON file. By the way, there's like three config files <laughs> just because of Webpack, which Ooh. is not great, but you can include all that stuff in if you want, or just stay asset pipeline because that's still supported at least for the time being. Cool. Good luck. All right. <laughs> Can I yell? Can people hear me if I yell? Because I can't type and do the thing. Sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to RB I RBM use 2.6.3. Um, that's the latest. I think it works with 2.4 or above, but um, 2.6.3 is what we want. And then I'm just going to do Rails new, and I'm going to say indie RB. 
and then I'm going to make sure to skip Turbo Links. So <laughs> tur Turbo Turbo Links uh, breaks lots of JavaScript things. So uh, skipping Turbo Links is good. If you, yes, if you don't skip it, um, there are four. I should, maybe I should have done that. Four things you have to three or four things that you have to comment out um, or get rid of. Uh, you can look it up. It's people have that problem all the time. So um, yeah. Oh, is it? Did, did it just install it with its turbo links? Yeah, you, yes, you did. You just didn't fit, you just fetched turbo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. RM dash RF. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Do it again. Turbo links. Awesome. I guess I could have done this step beforehand. But that's right. Um, after this, we'll uh, run rank T to show you the new Webpacker tasks. And oh, so notice there, it's doing stuff with Babel. So it is already getting um, your um, yarn file. There it says no lock file found. So it's already doing JavaScript stuff. So now when you make a new Rails uh, application, you have Ruby stuff going on and you have JavaScript stuff going on right from the beginning. Okay, uh, if we do rake T now. Oh, if I am in the right place. Then here you can see all the Webpacker commands. So, uh, yeah, Angular, Coffee, Elm, ERB, React, which is what we're going to use, Stimulus, TypeScript, Vue, um, and then I guess you can manually compile it with compile, that's cool. I should have looked at what these work, but uh, we're just going to use the Webpacker install one. So we're going to uh, rake Webpacker install, React. So it already has a Webpacker, but now it's okay. Squirted uh, RackJS, awesome. All right, and we are going to start a server. Um, so this is running the Rails server now, but we also need to if so, this will work and show us our JavaScript. But if we want live reloads and stuff, then we have to run Webpack as well. So I'm going to open a new tab here, and I'm going to run bin slash Webpack uh, dev server. So there's a few Webpack things. Uh, you can just compile it once, or you can run Webpack dev server, and this will stay open, watch your JavaScript, and um, recompile it or retranspile it for you on the fly. Okay, there we go. So that looks good. Now let's take a look at localhost 3000 and see what we have. Not 8000. All right, we are on Rails. So that was easy, but we let's do some more things. All right. Uh, let's open a uh, text editor. This might be okay. Make it bigger. Okay. Um, all right. So the first thing we're going to need is a controller instead of the uh, default screen here. So let's generate one. We can Rails generate a controller. So we're going to generate a welcome <coughs> controller. <coughs> Okay, and um, as a little bit of an intro to Rails here, so most of these stuff it lives in your app directory that you care about. Um, it's hard to see, sorry, but uh, here we have app. Uh, we have the big ones are controllers, models, and views. So models are anything that hits the database. Controllers are taking that data and sort of packaging it up, getting it ready to show, and then a view is showing it. Um, now though, if we look at um, JavaScript, so there's a new JavaScript uh, folder here, and packs. So under packs is our, <coughs> our main entry points for JavaScript. And so there's two now, application.js, which is like application.js was before. And now, because we did the Webpacker React, we have hello react.jsx. And so um, we will look at this in a little bit and we'll make another one. But so this is React, load it all up. And so we're gonna see what this looks like. Okay, so we have our welcome controller. Um, let's put a, or let's go to routes actually, and then make a root to uh, welcome index. Yeah, Let me make sure I'm in the right spot in my notes. Let's just root welcome index. Uh, and then we need a view for that. So under views welcome, we are going to make a new index.html.erb file. And we're just gonna say, Hello, uh, why don't we say welcome, because we're in a welcome controller. All right, let's make sure that worked. So now at root, we go to welcome. So nothing fancy here, this is just a regular view. And I'm going to switch these two. 
Okay, now we want to try to make that hello uh, React JSX file show up. So this is where we get back to the part where Rails is kind of big and then we can sort of slot that in wherever we want. If we go into our hello React JSX, um, I'll explain uh, for anyone who doesn't know quite what uh, React is doing, I'll explain all that in a second, but what this, <coughs> what we care about right now is this. So what this is gonna do is gonna find the document, append a child, which is gonna be a div, and inside of that it's gonna render our, our application. And so wherever we load up that hello, I think I turn this off. So wherever we load up that hello React JSX file, it's gonna put in the bottom of that body a new div. So, um, so on whatever page we want, we can write a ERB tag here, and we can say uh, JavaScript pack tag. So this is anything in our packs is now we can load up as a JavaScript pack, and then we can say hello React. And now, so that's the same name as the uh, packs file here. And so now if we go and reload that, it says hello React. That's coming from React. All right, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we, oh, nothing has changed here yet. Jump right down. Um, let's go and look a little bit, and let's explain React a little bit. Okay. We can, let's see, we can get rid of this. Oh, it tells you at the top here, JavaScript path tag, hello React. So um, if you forget, then you can just look right there. Okay. So one thing Webpacker does, one thing that's great, is it allows you to import React or import JavaScript files like you might expect to import Ruby files. So if you don't have a build uh, build pipeline set up, you can't do this. You have to load stuff and then it's in a global space. But when you have a build pipeline set up, it knows where React is, it knows what React DOM is, it knows what prop types is, although we don't need them, so let's get rid of those. Um, and so you can import it, just like you might require a gem, or require a Ruby file. Uh, right now we just have one um, component here, it's called hello. Components always take props, and then they return, this looks like HTML, but it's actually something called JSX, so it's actually JavaScript. This throws people for a loop a lot of times. Um, it is actually JavaScript, and people hate it sometimes, but it's actually what makes React awesome. So if you are looking at this and you're saying, get that HTML out of my JavaScript, then I will say, actually, it's really, really cool. So, live with it for a while. If you hate the look of it, then uh, maybe maybe you'll like it at the end of this. Um, once we define our, oh, uh, this, by the way, is the same as saying return this. So that throws people sometimes too. Um, one line functions. So this is a function. Oh, it, also, if you don't, haven't used uh, ES6, this is an arrow function. So this is the same as writing function props except it automatically finds what this is, the keyword this. Um, so if you don't know the difference, then I would say use arrow functions because they almost always do what you expect them to, whereas regular functions don't. Um, okay, so we are returning a div and then we get to use it down here. So this is our custom component that we're using. Um, and we are what React DOM does is that inserts our custom component into the body uh, and we're creating a div. We'll show a different way, a more common way to do it in a second, but that's how they chose to do it, is insert it into a div. All right, so let's make this say something else. So instead of React, we will say, hello, indie RB. And if I save this, uh, it says compiled successfully. Should have recompiled it. Oh yeah, so it's been recompiling it when I'm saving it. Um, so, it recom so Webpack Dev Server automatically saw it, recompiled it, and now it says, hello, indie RB, without me refreshing, which is neat. <laughs> All right, let's figure out where we are. All right, I'm going to show you how to make a new pack. So say you don't want this Hello React thing anymore, uh, we're actually going get, to get rid of it here. Or no, I'm going to leave it for a second. Um, but I'm going to make a new pack. So in JavaScript packs, I can make a new file. I'm going to call this welcome. You can call it JSX if you want, or you can call it just .js. It doesn't really matter. Um, some people like JSX because it tells you there's JSX in it, but all React has JSX in it, so I just call it JS, that's fine. We are going to do essentially the same thing as the thing I just closed. So we're gonna import React and React DOM. 
uh, React DOM is separate from React. React is like a base of how components, um, it, it's most of it, and React DOM is just a small wrapper that just tells it how to insert itself into the DOM. Um, there are different places you can put React, like on mobile with React Native, and those don't use React DOM, they use a whole different thing, so um, that's why they're separate. And then we are going to define a constant called welcome, and that is going to be a function that takes props, although we don't use props uh, in this situation. And then I'm going to return um, a, we can return any HTML tag that we want, but remember this is JSX, so let's return a div, and inside the div we'll put an H1, and we'll say welcome from React. And then instead of the, instead of, um, we're going to copy this, but instead of the append child, what we're going to do, so after the DOM is loaded, instead of append child, we're going to go back to this, um, where did it go? Uh, welcome index view here, and we'll put it on top because just to show you that you can put things wherever you want, we'll put a new div, and we'll give it an ID of welcome. And once we have this div, this is gonna be the container where we're gonna put our React code. So inside of here, instead of append child, we are going to do document, dot get element by ID, welcome. And instead of hello, we are going to be putting our welcome component. So what this will do is create a welcome component that can, contains welcome from React. It'll find the div called welcome and it will stick that inside of it. So it should already be, oh, it should already be refreshed, except because we created a new pack, we have to restart the uh, Webpack dev server. So that's important because I didn't do that and it took me like half an hour to figure out what's going on. Okay, so now there's more files than just the three we had before. And if we go back here and hard refresh, do you have to refresh the other one too? So the console. I may have to re I may have to restart both servers. Shouldn't you have to? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know what happened. Um, we have to include the pack. So here's the hello react pack. Uh, we have to include the welcome pack too. All right. And once we do that and refresh the page, there we go. Now we get welcome from react, the welcome from ERB, or, and then the uh, hello indie RB. So this is kind of what I was talking about. You have some rails in there, and then you have two react things, and you can kind of choose where you put them on the screen. Um, and so I think this is really cool because now you don't have just one giant single page react app if you don't want to. You can do, so one thing I think that um, is neat is like if you have some static content you want, like a blog, you can serve your blog, and then your comments, that might be done in React, that might be dynamic, you know, but you can serve, for SEO purposes, you can serve the blog content, and then later you can load in the comments using React. That's one example. There's a bazillion examples of where you might want some dynamic stuff, some static stuff, um, and you can use multiple React components next to each other uh, pretty easily. All right, any questions before I... Going. Yep. I was taking notes. All right. Question notes. <laughs> Can't help you with that. Oh, um, <laughs> so this is kind of a new question for this new feature. Um, is there a preferred like data transport layer for like I guess is I'm used to React being like going through an API, so this is kind of like, it's, it doesn't, I, I don't understand how like we're generating the API and kind of what the data is for. <coughs> yeah, so this doesn't change any of that, so there's a few ways you can do it. One is you treat React like an API, so you make like a bunch of API, REST API calls, and then your React component loads up blank and then calls all those API calls. So that's one way to do it, that's still a valid way. The other way, now that you can do this, is, I mean, you could always do this, but you can preload some data on the page, in the page content, and when React loads, you can read that data. That is a valid way to do it as well. Um, could you give an example of what that might look like? Sure, so um, there are a couple hacky ways to do it, and uh, some maybe better ways to do it. Um, I don't know if I can live code it this quick, but you can, uh, so because you can load the page with some static stuff, you can, um, pre-create your data 
on the server side, put it into either a DOM element or the uh, just global JavaScript space, and then read it from React. So you don't have another API hit. Um, it is not server-side rendering of React, which is the next thing I was going to go to. So you can server-side render your React also, although that gets pretty complicated and you probably don't need to do that anymore. People used to do that for SEO purposes, but Google now indexes JavaScript. They say they don't do it as fast as static content, but uh, it still works. So unless you're like doing some really high-end you know, SEO, like if you run some really uh, big content site, you probably don't have to worry about server-side rendering, or, or so, <clears throat> yeah, you probably don't have to worry about it. That's the answer. Nope. Yeah, you can use uh, whatever you want. I like ERB, so. Yep. You can use uh, Haml, ERB, or Slim, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't change what you, what you can use. All right, uh, I'll do a little bit about, let's see. Um, I'll do a little bit of an intro to React, since we had a lot of people who were new to React. So if you already know React, then feel free to ignore me. Um, okay. React changes the way that uh, you think about doing JavaScript in a few different ways. Um, one is that we mix our markup and our logic now. And um, like I said before, I think that's one of React's superpowers. Sometimes uh, people don't like that, but I think that's pretty awesome, and I'll show you why. Uh, the way that you do that is the data that you have will flow through your React components and will always equal the same UI. And so, and then the data changes by changing something called state. So I'm gonna talk about props and state really quick. Uh, props we have here, so those are things, data that's external to the component, comes in as props, and then you can use it within your component. State is internal to the component, changes within that component, and then re-renders and uh, will change the UI for you. And so let me do just a quick example here. Um, we're going to have a counter. This is the classic example. So we're gonna have a counter, it's gonna get a props, which will probably be, which will be initial count. Um, and our counter is gonna have a button and we're just gonna click up. Um, and when we click it, it's gonna count up. So uh, the UI for that, if we imagine a, just a regular, uh, let's see if we have a button, right? and the button might say count up. And then we can display the count in a paragraph. So all this looks like normal um, HTML. So now we have two things we, that we wanna do. One is get the initial count, and then the next is make it so that we can increment the count. <clears throat> initial count, let's say that comes down from on high somewhere. So that's gonna come into the counter as props. And so when we render this, now that we've created this component, component, we can use it down here, just like we use the welcome component down here. Um, Self-closing tags, by the way, if you don't close a tag, like this H1 is closed, if you don't close it, you have to put the slash here. If you don't, there'll be an error. Um, and the way we pass props is with, it look like HTML attributes. And so I can say that the initial count, for example, and then I use curly braces. And inside the curly braces, I can put any JavaScript that I want. So I'm just going to put, uh, let's say five, so the number five, but inside the curly braces can be any, so not any JavaScript, I want any JavaScript expression. So we can't put like if statements in here, but you can do any JavaScript expression. Um, and then what this is gonna do is props here will contain, it'll be an object and it'll contain all my attributes. So props.count will be my initial uh, count. And I can display that in curly braces again. So inside of JSX, we have curly braces in attributes and curly braces to display it. And so we can say props.count. And now if I save this and come back here, then the count starts off as five. So that's props coming from welcome, getting shoved into count, and being displayed here. Now if I click this button, nothing happens yet. So let's fix that. Whenever in React you think about changing data, you're always gonna think about state. And so there is there are two ways to do this. One is with class components, and one is with function components. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about function components with hooks right now. If you uh, know about class components, or if you, but you will run into class components. So just know that there's two ways to do this, but I'm gonna import something called use state from React. So state is data that's gonna change. And so I can say use state, and then I pass in my initial value, which is gonna be props.count. 
and use state returns an array of objects. And the array is going to be the current count and then a function to set the count to something. So this is called array destructuring, uh, if this is confusing, but it's basically just saying new state returns an array. The first thing is the current value. The second thing is the function to update that value. So here now, instead of props.count, I'm just gonna use count, which is the current state. And so if I reload this now, it still says five because the initial value is still five. But now on my button, I can do this. So I can say on click, and on my click, I'm going to create another function here. And so on click, it will call this function. And I can say set count. And there's two ways I can do this. I can say count plus one. This is the easy way to do it. This is actually not the most correct way. but So I can set my count to my current count plus one. All right, so let's see what this looks like. We'll refresh. And then when we count up, it counts up. Because every time we click that, it runs the update function and uh, counts. You can see I'm not calling like render, or I'm not reloading this component or whatever. I'm not calling it again or anything like that. It happens all automatically. So when I call set count, it automatically knows to reload this component. And so that is kind of the beauty of React. It, you have your data, you change your data with these functions, and it automatically reloads your whole state tree. Uh, any questions about about that? Yeah. Um, you know the on click listener there. Uh huh. Do you have to always wrap it in a function? So it has to be a function. If I just did this, if I just said set count like that, then what would happen is when it loads this, it will um, execute this right away, and so uh, which will reload it, which will execute it again, and so it'll go in an infinite loop count up. I actually don't know what will happen if I reload, if I save this and reload it now. Yeah, it throws an error because it goes in an infinite loop. So this has to be a function. It's common to do this. So it's common to just make an error function like this. You can also pull it out here if you want. So you can be like uh, count up equals uh, arrow function set count. Yeah, so this is common as well. And then you, now here you can just say, oops, uh, count up. Uh, here also, so here's where you really want to use the second uh, version of um, not set state, uh, set count. So set count, instead of count plus one, inside of here, it can return the current state of this, so the current count, and then I want to say count plus one. So this gets a little more confusing, um, but this works also, let's make sure this works. Yeah, so this is the other form of, of the uh, setter functions, is it takes a callback inside here. Um, yeah. Set count um, named by convention, or is Yeah, it's named, so, by convention, you call this whatever your state is, and then you say set whatever your state is, but that's not that's not hard and fast. So I can say, uh, just like, set something, and it'll uh, it'll still work. So that'll still work. And I don't even have to say set, I could just say something, and that'll still work. So um, you're just, so what this array destructuring is doing is if I call that an array, then I can say my count is my array at zero, and my uh, something is uh, array at one. So that's exactly the same thing. Um, so yeah, you can call this whatever you want. And is it common in React to destructure the props in like the arguments? Uh, like uh, here? Yeah. Yes. So if I wanted to say count here, that's that's super common. Yeah. Um. Then I couldn't use count here. So I'd say so maybe I'd call this like uh, initial count, and then put initial count here, and then I'd have to say uh, count as initial count. I think that's right. Right. So the prop is coming in as count. I'm destructuring it as initial count, and then using that like that. Um, yeah, that's really common because then effectively what you get is uh, named arguments, which is really nice. So. No questions? Cool. All right, uh, let me see where I am. Uh, so, okay, we made a component. Um, the next thing that you can do is you can, inside of JavaScript, you can re so you can reuse these components. That's one thing that React is great at. So we're going to make a new folder called components. <coughs> and inside of components, we're going to make a new file, and we're going to call that counter.js. Uh, then, inside of that, we're going to import React. We don't need React DOM here, because we only use React DOM where we put React actually into the DOM. Uh, but we can extract this counter now put it into here, and export that counter as the default. So now we're defining the counter and exporting it from this counter.js file. 
And now we can, just like we import React, we can import counter from components slash counter. And so uh, now if we save this, I think this works, I may have to restart the thing, yeah. This, so this is still all connected. And so what we're doing now, so you can share components across packs, which is uh, really nice. Uh, now you can make your pack, which is whatever small bit of code or, that you want, and you can share components across your pack, um, or across your packs, which is great. So you can build up components, is also by conventions, you can name this whatever you want. You, some people name this like pages, some people say screens, components is very common. Uh, you might have a source folder here, and underneath that you have like different things, so it like, depends on how complicated it gets. Uh, okay, so that's that. Any questions about components? Cool. All right, who wants to see less React and more action text? Yeah, Ooh. that's what we're gonna do next. So I think I thought action text was super cool because uh, um, I, I have done rich text before and it's been a pain in the butt. So we are going to look at how easy or not it is to get a rich text editor in here. All right, uh, we need to uh, first install action text. So Rails action text install. All right, there we go. So you saw it did some yarn stuff and it did some uh, Ruby stuff. That's because this uses the tricks editor by Basecamp, so that's what that installed. And then it created our migrations. Um, like I said before, these migrations, they contain where all your data is gonna go. So that kind of threw me off a little bit, but all of your rich text goes into the tables defined by these migrations, not into your like regular um, model files. Uh, so because we have migrations, we need to migrate. So rake db migrate. Um, oh, the other thing this did, so action text installs active storage for you uh, if it's not already installed. So in the background, that's what it uses. So if you're curious how it did all of its uh, files and stuff, active storage is what it uses, uh, which means inside of our uh, project, there's now config storage.yml. And so this is where you go to change it, change what you're going to use. So we're just doing local right now, so that's just going to save it on the disk, which is fine. but. In production, you're going to use either Amazon or Google or something, right? And so this is where you go to set all that goodness is config storage. Um, once we have that, okay, so now we have our rich text capabilities, but we need a model to put that on. So let's make posts because everyone does posts. So we're going to uh, generate a scaffold for posts or just post, I think. Yeah, post, uh, and we're going to give it a title. So all of our text is gonna be, um, we don't have to define the text. So we'll see in, in, in the scaffold, we do that later. So we're just gonna give it a title. Okay, uh, we need to rate db migrate again. No, they made SF pipeline CSS files. What's that? Yes. Made, yeah. uh, it's at the bottom. Okay, yeah, so SF pipeline, still a thing. Yeah. Um, and then, okay. Then uh, let's load pending migration. Okay, so now if we go to slash posts, we have our posts. This is a normal scaffold, and notice right now there's just title. So let's see if we can change that. Uh, inside of our post model, so model post, um, here is where we do the link to uh, uh, action text. So we can say as rich uh, text, and then I'm going to use content, but you can call it whatever you want. And now that is all we have to do to hook up the model to rich text, which is pretty cool. We do have to, though, uh, make sure it saves properly. And so in the uh, post controller, we're going to go down to our post params. So we have title already, and now we need to say, also save content. So um, that when it comes in from the form, it can actually save it. All right, cool. Now let's go to our form uh, in posts form. So this is all, if you haven't seen scaffolds before, all this was created by scaffold, the Rails G scaffold, otherwise you have to do it all yourself. Uh, but that's why I used the scaffold. Uh, here is our title. And so we're gonna do the same thing. So we have our title, we're gonna do the same thing for content. And then instead of text field, we're going to say rich text area content. Okay. Now let's make a new post. There we go. We get a title and we get rich text. 
which I think is pretty cool. All right, so we have a, a real post and rich text, and we can make it bold and italic. That's exciting stuff. All right, and <laughs> we can create the post. All right, now in our scaffold, it just says title post, um, but let's actually show the rich text. So we're gonna go back to our welcome index.js file, and down here under everything, or actually in our uh, controller, let's fetch all our posts. So in index, we'll say that our posts equals uh, post at all. And then in our welcome index file, we can iterate over those. So at posts.each post. And uh, we can print out the post title. And then uh, the magic words for the content is post dot, oh, content. I thought there was magic words. It's just content. All right, cool. Content, thank you. I'm missing div. Div? Line 10, div. It's div. Awesome, there we are. All right, cool. I thought you said missing div, which is also true. I was gonna put that in a div. I don't have to, but. Cool, I think that's right. Uh, okay, so let's go back to our root. <coughs> and there we go, here is our rich text. Ooh. Yay, it's ready to go. All right. <laughs> um, <coughs> did we put the title in there? What was the post title? Oh, the title was post, yes, it's right there. <laughs> um, so there you go. Uh, notice also, here's our hello indie RB that's coming from our React because it's putting it at the bottom of the uh, div. That's one reason I like the method where you put a div where you want it and then you find that div and stick your content in it. Because if you just stick stuff at the bottom of the page, then it's just gonna show up at the bottom of your page, which might be not where you want it, so. Uh, yeah, so um, one, the last thing, just about the last thing I'll show you is if I go to make a new post, and I thought this was gonna work, so like say I have an image and I upload an image, <coughs> then it totally shows up here and it totally creates it. And then when I go to the root, it totally doesn't show it. And I try to figure that out for like an hour. And uh, yeah, so mini magic isn't installed. I install mini magic and then it gives me a mini magic error. And so I don't think it's my local machine. I think it might be a bug, but we'll see. If anyone wants to debug that, then that'd be cool too. But yeah, so that's about it. Um, any questions about action text? I thought it was a pretty cool, easy way to get rich text. What is it actually? Is that like a Yeah, so it is, uh, it's trying to resize my image, uh, and it says that first it's not installed, and then when I install it, it says that it's trying to use a, an invalid, like a flag, basically, for mini magic. Um, I don't know what it's trying, it's trying to resize it to fit something like limit size or something is the actual error. And so, I don't exactly know what to do. I tried it for an hour, then I gave up, sorry. Any other questions? For the rich text, uh, what does that look like? Does it show up as, as markup or is it uh, marked down? That's a good question. We can take a look at that, I guess. Um, so the rich text, uh, it's stored inside of, actually, I can probably just say post.first.content. Um, that body, apparently. Yeah, it's probably HTML. Yeah, it looks okay. like HTML. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Well, I think it's being... It's it's an action text content, so that's, I don't know how to get the. That's a two that's fine. What's that? Just the letter. <clears throat> try try two s on it. Yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. Good call. Neat. So yeah, it's just HTML, which is kind of neat. So back at the beginning, when you made the uh, webpack hookup, mm -hmm. there is a way to do, if you know you want React ahead of time, to make a new Rails app and automatically set up the React in one go. Yes, there is a flag yep. to do that. Um, I didn't do it so I could show you all the right oh. stuff, but yep. Uh, yep. All right.
That's all I had. I can answer any questions about Rails or React, but otherwise, thanks for listening. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>